Welcome. It's lovely to be here at an Alpine Club meeting at Floral Hall. Many thanks to Richa and Liz for organizing everything. Tonight I'll share a range of reflections about mountains. Stories, paintings, poems, photos, and science. Many of the paintings and poems are in a small book we published in 2018. We'll spend most of our time in the Tantalus Range, take a brief excursion up to Garibaldi Lake, and finish in the Rockies. I'm an environmental scientist, skier, occasional mountaineer, and part-time poet. My compadre is Dennis Brown, an accomplished artist who loves doing paintings en plein air in the mountains, one or two hour efforts, as well as much more laborious paintings completed over several weeks or months at home. Dennis spent many years working in the fishing industry and wrote a fascinating book called Salmon Wars. This is Dennis's plein air painting of the ACC Tantalus hut at Lake Lovely Water with Mount Omega in the background. We met in 2013 at the Tantalus Hut. I'd heard about Dennis's climbing exploits and salmon scholarship, but we were both happily surprised to discover shared passions for not only mountains and salmon, but also art, poetry, photography, philosophy, and last but not least, the Grateful Dead. Together with a merry band of friends, we went up to the Tantalus together for four more times until 2019. We haven't been back since then. I'm grateful to Dennis and our good friend Derek Brackley for organizing these trips and ensuring that everyone returns safely from their mountain adventures. My enjoyment of poetry was nurtured by my dad, my uncle Walter, who both loved comic verse. I would often write silly poems or doggerel for birthdays, retirements, and the final nights of backcountry ski trips, occasionally doing spoofs of rock songs like I've Just Skied a Face, Slab Shall Be Released, or Pinwheel Wizard. But in the wilderness, I would write more contemplative haiku and poems. I find a strong connection to the writing of John Muir from the late 19th century as he tramped through mountains in California and Alaska and also Mary Oliver. So there were some seeds there that just required a bit of encouragement from Dennis to sprout. And this motley crew of Tantalusians seen here in 2014 in a photograph by Keith Rajala, who is here tonight, was the catalyst for our joint creative efforts. Dennis has inspired a half dozen of us to enjoy the calm focus that comes from just sitting, looking, and painting. Suspending our inner art critic and just playing with paints. The result is less important than the experience. The Alpine Club hut is situated at the east end of Lake Lovely Water, just 6.2 kilometers west of the Squamish Airport. To get there, one can take a jet boat along the Squamish River and then hike for about four to seven hours up to the Tantalus cabin. However, our group has chosen to fly up by helicopter from the Squamish airport with Black, Black Tusk helicopters. In 2019, the helicopter cost was $3,000, which worked out to $230 each for the 13 of us in our group. It's always amazing to be transported into this alpine wonderland in just five minutes by helicopter. And of course, we always check the helicopter very carefully before flying. This is the view from the cabin. It's astounding the first time you see it and every time thereafter. The cabin has a couple of rowboats and a canoe, which are great for accessing various hiking and climbing routes. It's quite a treat to just canoe around the shoreline of the lake. But the mountains do beckon. 
and merit some introductions through Greek mythology and the Greek alphabet. Tantalus was the son of Zeus and the nymph Pluto. He was made to stand in a pool of water beneath a fruit tree with low branches, with the fruit ever eluding his grasp and the water always receding before he could take a drink, which seldom occurs with all the snow around Tantalus. Tantalus and Dion became a couple and resulting were the parents of son Pelops, who inspired the Olympic Games, and daughter Niobe, who had a tough life. Her children were eventually slain and she was turned to stone. And based on our empirical observations over five years, Niobe is still composed of stone. So here you have it, Niobe, Pelops, Tantalus, and Dion, four of the main mountains in the Tantalus area. Mounts Alpha, Iota, and Omega don't have any special place in Greek mythology, but are letters in the Greek alphabet. In the book of Revelation, which I learned about from the book of Wikipedia, God declares himself to be the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Mount Alpha would be an inappropriate beginning for a novice climber and might lead to his or her end. Omega, bottom right, was the first roped climb for some of our group back in 2013, as you'll now hear. You may not care one iota about Mount Iota here at the lower left, but it is a lovely excursion from the Tantalus hut and can be climbed safely without a rope. The best mountaineering stories involve getting into a jam and then getting out of it. The connections that led to our book began with an adventure on Mount Omega on July 11th, 2014. It began with eight of us rowing in two boats across Lake Lovely Water to a lovely beach on the south side. In hindsight, eight was a large number for a roped climb. We then hiked up a steep creek that drains the snow fields and alpine meadows up above. The creek leads up to a lovely alpine meadow from which one can ascend scree and snow to the base of Mounts Omega, Iota, and Pelops. The amount of snow in this area varies a lot from year to year. More snow makes it a lot easier to ascend and descend. We were soon crossing the lovely alpine meadows to the ridge of Mount Omega that we plan to climb, seen here on the right skyline. It's partly low class five for the first part and partly a hike for the last part. Dennis led most of the group up a safe route that followed natural cracks in the ridge. Two of us went a slightly different way. After a few hours, all eight of us got to the summit. Our group was very diverse, some with lots of mountaineering experience and two people who had never previously done a roped climb. And we were able to enjoy spectacular views in all directions. That's Mount Alpha on the far side of Lake Lovely Water with Mount Serratus to the left and Mounts Dion and Tantalus in the distance. The Jim Haberl hut is on the far side of Serratus. I've never been up to that beautiful cabin, but many of my Tantalusian compadres have say it's fantastic. It took a really long time for eight of us to rappel down the mountain as we each went one at a time. And there were two rappels, 16 
repels altogether. We used a safety rope for the people who had less experience. As the sun began to set, the probability of a nighttime adventure began to rise. It was a very pleasant place to wait for your turn to repel. Soon the sun was gone, and we discovered that we had only four headlamps among the eight of us. I was one of those without a headlamp, sitting in the cabin next to the book I was reading. Ever since that event, I've taken two headlamps, one which never leaves my pack. The lack of headlamps made the descent down snow fields and streamside trails quite tricky, but we took our time emphasizing safety over speed. Dennis's nephew, Brendan, carried two backpacks to lighten the load of one of our group who was exhausted. Our return across the lake was aided by our friend Keith, who acted as night watchman, standing on the dock with a kerosene lantern. We got back to the hut at midnight, utterly ravenous, and were blessed to find a scrumptious seafood stew awaiting us, prepared by our friend Peggy. Peggy Stew, Peggy Stew. Stories of adventures often involve some embellishment. The next morning, I scribbled down this doggerel in my journal. As half-lit, half-wits, we descended late, guided by four headlamps instead of eight, over wet snow above rushing streams, torrents that could drown both us and our screams. With relief at last, we got to the lake, watching moonbeams shine off our rowboat's wake. With Keith's lamp lovingly guiding our crew, we made a beeline for dear Peggy's stew. All safe at home, we could barely mumble as we vacuumed up her apple crumble. Dennis, like this, learned that I often wrote poems and suggested publishing them. I dismissed the idea and told him, Dennis, it's your paintings that should be published. I just write poems for fun. Here's one of Dennis's lovely paintings from the Tantalus Range. Mount Pelops on the left, Mount Niobe on the right. Time went by. Our dialogue about publishing poems or paintings continued. And then in 2017, Dennis suggested we publish a book together, his paintings and my poems. Perhaps one plus one would equal three, or at least 2.5, hopefully not a number less than two. I perused various poems I had lying around in journals from camping, climbing, and skiing trips and found matches with five of Dennis's paintings. But five would be a very short book. So I wrote another nine poems to match other paintings on Dennis's website, ones that evoked some feeling or memory or an opportunity to ponder the unfathomable contrast between the lifespans of mountains and humans. I'm drawn to the moments in which the background noise in our brains stop and we feel truly connected to nature. But my science brain rarely shuts off. I would stare at one of Dennis's paintings and then be off on some scientific procrastination before getting down to putting words on the page. Those science tangents work their way into the poems, as you'll hear. Slowly, the book took form, especially with the talented help of Susie Johnson, our close friend, graphic designer. It began to feel real. And then we started to search for a title. Dennis told me about the wilderness poet, Gary Snyder, and that led to this story. One night, Gary's friend, Lou Welch, was sitting with him by a campfire 
outside under the pine trees and stars up in the Sierra Nevada. And after a long while of silence, Lou said, Gary, do you think the rocks pay attention to the trees? And Gary said, why, I don't know, Lou. What are you driving at? And Lou said, well, the trees are just passing through. And so passing through became the title of our book. To our great surprise, we've sold about 350 of these with all the profits going to a nonprofit organization that does orthopedic surgeries in Ecuador. We have just a few copies left. And if we run out tonight, give us your email and we'll email you a PDF version. because We don't really want to bother printing anymore. <laughs> This was one of the many plein air paintings that Dennis did up at Lake Lovely Water. This is Mount Niobe with Mount Omega in the background. Dennis painted this from the so-called Russian Army Camp, an enormous snowfield that Bruce Fairley noted in his 1986 guidebook had, quote, enough room to camp the Russian Army. A sadly ironic name now. This poem, which mentions the Russian army camp, grew out of the great camaraderie of the Tantalus group. Tantalusian enthusiasm. You must tell your son and tell your daughter of the splendors of Lake Lovely Water. The mountains a teacher greater than Sears for helping your children to quell their fears, including the children inside of us, who in urban chaos are prone to fuss. But somewhere between Russian army camp and a screaming bum slide on pants so damp, our inner playful kids are all released and find a lovely water glow of peace, contemplating each moment long after the light, the meals, the friends, and the laughter. So this is Russian army camp at the west end of Lake Lovely Water, looking east towards Mount Garibaldi in the distance. It's a great destination for hikers who may be less inclined towards mountaineering. A one hour row each way on the lake and two to three hours of scampering up and climbing around. And this is the view looking west from this area, showing the cirque near Mount Serratus. The sounds of calving glaciers and waterfalls reverberate throughout the cirque. On a couple of occasions, we've done a lovely circle route, which involves rowing down to the west end of Lake Lovely Water, and then climbing southeast, mostly up snow, uh, to the top of Mount Niobe, then over south to Mount Pelops, and then descending that and back down snow fields and eventually to the lake. It helps to have friends who are willing to row the boat back from where we left it at the west end of Lake Lovely Water. Now this photo from Google Earth may look a bit strange with the ice only at the west end of the lake but we have experienced that before in June as the wind blew all the ice to one end. Tonight we'll take a meandering tour with stops for five poems where the blue dots are. One of Dennis's great joys has been mountaineering and painting with his two nephews, Brendan and Connor. This painting, done from near the cabin, is called Tantalus Sunshine. 
Later, during a dark and rainy January in Vancouver, Dennis wrote this poem to accompany this painting. Tantalus Sunshine We sat with our paints at the edge of the still Viridian Lake. The nearby stream, roaring with the day's heat, fed us drafts of cool air. Now, in the darkness of January, I recall that light. We sought refuge from it in the dense trees at the water's edge while we sketched. There were lots of bugs. Elsewhere, billions of clocks were no doubt busily keeping time. But for us, time seemed to stop. In memory of that near blinding light, I now grasp at the hope that I will return to watch once again those mountains as they make their way across that infinite blue sky. In most years, there are snow fields on the south side of the lake in the shade of Niobe. Dennis painted this while sitting in a rowboat. Sometimes you can canoe right under this snow field and hear the snow dripping down into the lake water, which led to this poem. Snowfield. Born in the shadows of Niobe's wall, just a small patch of snow late in the fall. All winter you grew, fed by each passing storm. Gravity, winds, and sloughs shaping your form. Now you're fading, melting in summer's heat, rising lake water, dissolving your feet, obeying physics till your last day's done, melting, melding, till ice and lake are one. Rowing all the way down the lake takes about an hour. It's especially wonderful when the lake is this calm. Rowing or paddling through the icebergs is a meditative experience. So far, there have been no Tantalus Titanic incidents. One of our gang, Catherine, a competitive swimmer, was brave enough to dive in from the western end of the lake and swim around for several minutes. I think the water temperature was about six degrees. Getting to the snow that leads up to Niobe from the west end of Lake Lovely Water involves quite a bit of bushwhacking, but the views and the destination make it all worthwhile. Eventually, you get to some lovely snow ramps that lead up towards Niobe. It was just about at this spot, on the second time we did this circuit, that we had the rare and joyful experience of seeing a wolverine. That led to a lucky photograph and the following poem. Wolverine. We stood together on the steep slope, the six of us 
climbing up Niobe. As five of us looked up, Connor looked down. Oh, there's the Wolverine, he said calmly, as if he'd expected it to be there. He'd seen two of them two days before, when we were all climbing up Iota, a mum and her young one, he had surmised. So we guessed that this one was the same mum. She was a hundred meters below us, running very fast over the wet snow, moving away from us towards a scree slope. And then she stopped. For just a second, looking up at us, perhaps calculating that six climbers each with big backpacks and sharp ice axes were just not worth the trouble of a fight. I felt such a mixture of feelings, blessed at our luck to see such rare beauty, amazed at how fast she moved over snow, wary of her size and immense power and kinship, two different species moving over the same wet summer snow. Eventually, <clears throat> we reached the summit of Niobe. Here are our friends, Derek Brackley, Eric Mulholland, and Ron Eckert. The summit of Niobe provides magnificent views towards Mount Alpha and Lake Lovely Water. The Tantalus Cabin at the east end of the lake near the left side of this rainbow. After descending off Niobe, we wandered over to the steep icy slope between Niobe and Pelops, thinking that it might offer a faster route home to the hut. I do love a long glissade, but I couldn't see clearly down the slope, and I suspected that there was a crevasse somewhere below. This picture was taken later. We had three experienced mountaineers and one novice. After walking back and forth for quite a long time, you can perhaps just see my footsteps at the lower left, my spidey sense told me that it was safer to take the long route home, up and around Pelops. That pondering led to the following poem. Between a rock and a hard place. Hoping for a glissade on snow, I tread to the lip of the slope, but can see just far, far below. There's an ice cliff down there. Danger. Fear runs through my blood and body. A slip on ice, a slide to death in a crevasse, or on the rocks. The cortex calms the limbic brain. There's no safe path from A to B. We must find another route home. We retreat up snow and climb the rock that just might lead to Pelops. And it does, safely up the ridge to a spectacular summit from which we can easily see the wisdom of our decision. We need to listen to our fears, play some limbic 
cortex tennis? Sometimes fears can lead us astray and sap our precious energy. But other times they save our lives. The view from above confirmed the wisdom of our decision. In the following year, those narrow crevasses had widened considerably. And so we descended from Pelops down the snowfield, meadows, and stream that brought us back to Lake Lovely Water. After a long day going up and down mountains and being tired, <clears throat> one's attention is appropriately focused on the very next step. It's nice, however, on a rest day to just sit next to a rushing stream, listen and look. The turbulent water rebounding off a rock is never exactly the same. Physicists describe turbulent flow as a form of unpredictable chaos, which led to this poem. River at play, falling, jumping, swirling, crashing, calling, whumping, curling, splashing, sunlight sparkling, photons flying, hydraulic and solar chaos, infinitely variable in your liquid language and light. This picture was taken from the beach on the south side of the lake on a sunny July day in 2018. You can hike, row, or paddle to this spot. A bunch of us sat there and painted for a couple of hours with encouragement from Dennis, whom you can see in the lower left. He uses a five by seven inch piece of plywood and acrylic paints for his en plein air paintings. Mount Alpha looks on approvingly. I'm a total novice at painting, having abandoned art in grade eight and then rediscovered the joy of sketching two decades later when my camera went kaput in Nepal. So we sat on the beach, looking carefully at the splendid scene before us mixing paints to try to match the colors we saw, serenaded by the stream which enters the lake here. I enjoyed that focused meditative time and was pretty happy with the result. Not bad for a grade eight art class dropout. Please note the caveat at the lower left. Some of our Tantalusian gang have climbed Mount Alpha, shown here in the center of the picture. I've only been up the slopes on the left or western side to the point where the snow meets the rock. Our reconnaissance trip partway up Mount Alpha was delightful and yielded this doggerel in my journal. Six of us climbed up the Alpha approach where a tongue of snow, the rock, doth encroach. And there we observed with a shout of glee that the route from there was class four or three. And though this knowledge much reduced our fear, we had neither sufficient time nor gear to continue on to Alpha's summit, perchance to rejoice, perchance to plummet. And so with care through beauty we descended through meadows of heather, carefully tended by rivulets meandering their way, fed by melting snow on this sunny day, 
Down snow and scree traveled our merry crew, arriving home in time for Peggy's stew. This was a different Peggy stew from the one after our epic on Mount Omega, but just as delicious. Across the Squamish Valley from Tantalus, it's not far to Garibaldi Lake. I had an instant connection to Dennis's painting of Garibaldi Lake and the Sphinx Glacier. Back in the 1980s, I had skied the Garibaldi Neve with some friends. Of course, Garibaldi Lake was frozen in the wintertime. This was in the days of skinny telemark skis. There were two weird things about that trip. The first weird thing was that as we were coming to the end of the Neve near the top of Sphinx Glacier, I heard this weird sound every time I moved forward. It was a bright, cloudy day, and I thought that perhaps negative ions in the air were cascading down onto my ice axe that was on my backpack. So in those days, I had aluminum lifelink poles, and I stuck out the pole, and I heard and then I raised the pole a little higher and the sound pitch increased. And I thought, oh, I'll do an experiment and hold my ski pole right in the air, which I did and instantly got an electric shock, which ended that experiment, but uh, with no fatal consequences. The ski down the Sphinx Glacier was fantastic. I remember it as getting steeper and steeper. And we stayed next to the UBC geology huts on the far side of the lake. The second weird thing happened the next day, just as we were about to cross Garibaldi Lake. Of course, it was snow covered. My friend Barry started grabbing at, grabbing at his various pockets of his Gore-Tex jacket and pants and then swearing. And I asked what was up and he said, oh, I left the key to my truck that's parked at Black Tusk parking lot back at the Diamond Head parking lot in Tim's truck. So this was awkward and all the way down the windy Black Tusk trail, we wondered what was going to happen. When we got down there, uh, there were some nice American guys and we asked if they had a coat hanger. And they said, sure, and gave us a coat hanger and we were able to break into Barry's 1971 Datsun truck. And then we wondered whether we might be able to hotwire it, or at least Barry and Tim, who had some competence in this area, wondered about that. And we asked the American chaps and they said, oh yeah, we've got some wire. And <laughs> gave us some wire. So Barry and Tim successfully hotwired his truck and it ran fine all the way back to um, Diamond Head parking lot. So thinking about that trip and those geology huts led to some geological procrastination, which eventually enriched the poem that I wrote. I found an amazing article from 2009 describing changes in the glaciers of Garibaldi Park. The dark gray area shows the maximum extent of the Sphinx Glacier during the Little Ice Age in the early 1700s. The dotted white area shows its extent as of 2003, about 60% smaller than in 1700. It has almost certainly shrunk further in the last 20 years. The lines at the lower left show the changes over the last century. Back in 1928, Sphinx Glacier almost reached all the way to Garibaldi Lake. The glaciers in Garibaldi, Lake, in Garibaldi Park have also become thinner, indicated by the yellow, orange, and red colors on this map. The blue areas 
appear to have thickened, but the authors say that's likely an error in the 1928 maps. In the 60 years between 1928 and 1987, Sphinx Glacier thinned by 50 meters as snow melted. During that 60 year period, about 14 cubic kilometers of ice melted from all the glaciers in Garibaldi Park. That's about 12 times the volume of Garibaldi Lake. Eventually, I stopped my geological procrastinating and wrote a poem to go with Dennis's painting. It has a mixture of elation from earlier ski trips and sadness at the changes brought about by global warming. Sphinx Glacier. Back when I skied your slopes with swoops of glee, each turn a leap of gravity and hope, I felt like we were all one together. The snow and skis and sun and ice and me. We camped that night by Lake Garibaldi, our group so proud of crossing the Neve, and keen to cross the lake the next morning, then down the trail to roads that led back home. We never paused to ponder how you'd changed. In 50 years of time, your glacial mass drawn down to half what it had once been. From sea to snow to ice and back to sea. Many of Dennis's most spectacular paintings are from the Rockies. They evoke similar feelings to his paintings from the Tantalus. This painting of Lake Louise led me back to my first time in the Rockies as a young teenager with my parents who loved hiking. Each of us here tonight were blessed to have someone who took us, who took us up into the mountains. Mountains 101. My first time in the Rockies, staying near Lake Louise in a log cabin with my parents. We hiked over mountain passes and up to alpine lakes, sharp, jagged peaks just beckoning. I'd run ahead along the steep trail, impatient to round the next bend and drink in more glorious views, but then would have to stop and wait so mom and dad wouldn't worry about where I was or wasn't. At last, we'd climb over a ridge that hid our destination and then gasp twice, once to catch our breath and once at a bright turquoise jewel nestled prettily in her ring of gray peaks, boulders and moraines, a color contrast so crazy, the rods in our retinas danced. Looking back now to that time with 50 years of life since then, I wonder if two loves began one for mountains and one for lakes, fueling deep curiosity in what lies above and below those shimmering surfaces. And a third love for my parents, which was strong before those hikes, but grew stronger with shared wonder in the exploration of high places. That love deepens even right now 
thinking back to those summer days. When I looked at Dennis's painting of Moraine Lake, I was a bit overwhelmed at the thought of writing a poem to go with it. What could I possibly add? So again, I procrastinated and looked up the geology. I found a wonderful booklet written in 1960 by Helen Bellier of the Geological Survey of Canada which described the landslide down Mount Babel that created Moraine Lake and mentioned lower Cambrian quartzites. So I then looked at what was around in the lower Cambrian period and decided that this poem should be written from the point of view of a trilobite embedded in those rocks. I couldn't find any living trilobites to write the poem for me. But it turns out that there's a whole trilobite subculture promoted by the brilliant Ray Troll from Ketchikan, Alaska. So I thought that the trilobite perspective might really expand the market for our book. Anyway, Here's the poem. A Trilobite's View of Moraine Lake. Rewind the film by a billion years. Waves washing over shallow coastal shelves. Trilobites swimming through the warm waters, slurping plankton, growing, mating, dying. Unaware, as are we, of their futures. Forced, folded, fractured by tectonic plates, cracked, cleft, and cut by frost crystals and rain, scratched, shifted, and sculpted by vast glaciers, locked into rocks of quartz, sandstone, and shale, in the ten peaks guarding the southern flank, tumbled and smashed in Babel's huge landslide, the damned creeks to create this turquoise jewel discovered by Nakoda deer hunters and much later by stunned geologists whose joyful lives playing in the mountains were but a drop in the oceans of time. I love how Dennis can capture mountain light. This painting of Arnica Lake in Banff National Park captures that feeling you get as the sun is setting over an exquisite view and you're reaching for your down jacket. And that feeling led to this short poem. Autumn Light. Mountain trees gathering the waning light, beaming trillions of photons to my eyes, alpine wave particles of sheer delight, shimmering through the late afternoon skies before the long and cold autumnal night. This is Dennis's painting of Mount Rundle. I love how the swirling clouds are punctured by the swirling rocks of the mountains. And here's a poem about clouds. Clouds. Clouds 
we learned in geography are just condensed water vapor heated by solar energy. But they neglected to show us those swirling early morning mists gently caressing the cedars and willows along the bank, then ascending ever upward into blue-white sinuous snakes, skeletons, pelicans, faces, flowers, kayaks, and butterflies. A cumulus cloud conference of animals, plants, and objects gathered for just a short exchange before drifting off on their own unknowable trajectories, perhaps reforming oceans away to delight a small child at play. Dennis's painting of the Bow River in fall led to a poem that really comes closest to the title of our book, Passing Through. There is a bit of geology in this one too, as well as some physics, chemistry, and biology thrown in. Living on Mountain Time. A billion years ago, carbon was flowing through a great inland sea, building the rock that became these mountains. That old carbon now rushes down the Bow River, returning to the sea of its birth as waves of water are bathed in waves of light. Carbon is flowing into each leaf, even as it changes from green to brilliant red or yellow, enriching the painter's palette. Carbon is flowing out of my lungs, just over half a billion breaths so far. My life in breaths, just half the mountain's age in years. After the last of these breaths, my carbon will return to these peaks, this river, these trees I've been so blessed to briefly see. Thanks so much to all of you for coming. We're so glad we're all able to be together here in Floral Hall. I hope that many of you will someday get up to Lake Lovely Water and enjoy the Tantalus Range. And for those of you who have been there before, I hope this evening brought back many fond memories. Dennis and I are happy to answer any questions you may have. We have a few books for sale at the table for $20 each, as well as some cards and posters. If we run out of books, there's a sheet on which you can add your email and we'll send you a free PDF of the book. If there are enough people interested in getting a physical copy of the book, we might get some more printed. Thanks.